Fight Every Crisis, Global Perspectives of a Post-Corona Economy. On behalf of the Cusanos University, I welcome you all to our digital lecture series and today's session on a new global narrative, global climate activism of a young generation with Natasha van Mwanza and Luisa Neubauer. My name is Benjamin. I am the facilitator of this lecture. It's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce to you our fantastic speakers today, two remarkable and well-known young activists, political thinkers, advocates, and change makers, Natasha Mwanza and Luisa Neubauer. Natasha Mwanza is, was born and raised in Zambia. She advocates for girls and women and is passionate about using the media to empower girls and young people in general. Natasha works as a junior reporter, journalist, child and women's rights activist at a media network on child rights and development. Through her outstanding work and dedication, she was selected a member of the African Union Commission's Youth Advisory Board. She became internationally known for the first time through her appearance at the World Economic Forum in Davos last year, and she is the youngest recipient of the World Health Organization's Global Health Leader Award. Natasha runs her own foundation, a nonprofit that seeks to create an enabling environment for young people to be empowered, healthy, and safe. And she is currently studying media and communication studies. Welcome, Natasha. Thanks for joining us today. And Luisa Neubauer is one of Germany's most visible and famous climate activists and key organizer of the climate justice movement. She works with various NGOs for climate protection, generational justice and against poverty. And she took part in several global climate conferences and other important political events, such as the World Economic Forum in Davos, together with Natasha and Greta Thunberg. Luisa holds a BA in geography and is currently studying a resource analysis and management in Göttingen. Together with Alexander Repening, a Cusanos alumni, she published a book vom Ende der Klimakrise, eine Geschichte unserer Zukunft, a book that deals with questions of new narratives as well, which leads us to the topic of our session, a new global narrative, global climate activism of a young generation. Welcome, Luisa, as well. Thanks for being here in this session today. And the last person to introduce to you is Celia Graupe, Professor of Economics and Philosophy, Head of the Institute of Economics, co-founder and vice president of the Cusanos University. Celia Graupe will moderate the dialogue and interview with Natasha and uh, Luisa. So without further ado, I hand over to you, Silvia, and I'm very curious to this session and to the interview with these two young activists. Most of our listeners are young people really try to find their way. And I, I just read a lot of you, Natasha, and you just said, say, well, everyone can have a voice. Everyone can make a difference. And this is what I really want to find out with you today. So how can, especially young people, how can we as women make a difference? And so, so this whole uh, lecture series, it's about the changes we can bring in COVID-19 times and times of crisis. And so first, I really want to talk not about your great CVs, they are just great, it's a, yeah, but just about your experiences and how do you really concretely make differences, especially over the last year. Um, then I want to talk about your experiences as activists and really try to bring it together, because what I believe is that it doesn't really matter so much what field you are in, but like the spirit you bring to it and all the values and the actions. And this I want to find out. Um, because you're in different fields, but I can, I, I think there's a, there are common values uh, you share. And then I want to talk more on a, um, on a global perspective. I want to talk about economics and the role of economics in, in all of this, um, the role of um, imaginations and narratives. And as uh, Luisa, you know, we are talking a lot about it already. And the last is that we want to really get into what do you expect of education? How can we make a difference in, exp uh, in education so that uh, uh, going on strike on educational strikes is not only the solution, but that we really bring reform to the educational sector. Um, so what I want to do is now really to start with, uh, with a question about concrete experiences and turning to you to Natasha first. 
um, if you really think about the last year, so can you give us an example of your work? We really say, well, this is an um, example of, of what you do, like be as concrete as you can. So um, thank you so much. First, I would like to say it is such an honor to be here, to be able to speak in front of all of you and even just to be able to share a platform with someone as amazing as Louisa and even the coordinators and the moderators today. It's an honor. And every other student that's in this room, it's really an honor. Thank you to the university for this opportunity. So concrete things that I've actually done um, over the past year. Well, as many of us know, the past year has not been the easiest of years to actually get through because it no one expected the pandemic and no one expected that it was actually going to affect us as much as it did you know we made plans for the year we thought of conferences for instance with my foundation we thought of conferences we thought of trainings we thought of going out for outreaches and interacting with people the way we used to in 2019 you know before all this happened but alas it happened and we had to start strategizing and re-strategizing and thinking of how best we can actually be a light a voice and a solution in a time when it felt like it was way too dark and so for us this was an opportunity to actually get out of the box and say you know we've all heard of it crisis is the mother of invention and there's so much that we can do it's never an end if we're still alive then there's so much more that we can do as young people so the first thing we did is we did not think of the natasha Mansa foundation or its plans and strategies we thought of our target we thought of the young people and we thought to ourselves what do young people think they need during this time you know what can we do to make this time easy and better for them and so that's how we reached out and so that's how from having 20 less than 20 members as part of the foundation we grew globally and we had over 300 members join the foundation from all over the world and we had this thing called a safe space online it's a global community where we would all just convene and would talk and we became a family because we knew that firstly young people need time to adjust to the changes that have taken place it wasn't easy what everyone was going through schools had locked down you're not able to hug or see your friends anymore you're not able to do life as normal and we thought why not create a safe space for young people to learn to adjust and readjust to everything that's going on and so we came up with an online global community and it was really big it still is right now and it's still growing and we have young people they are talking and discussing and just building a family as much as we can so for us that's one of the most tangible things that we actually did and alongside that we had so many experts coming in and teaching us on certain things because for instance we are specialized in sexual and reproductive health but because of COVID-19 it was really hard to advocate on that we even make it such a big issue because all the resources seem to be going to COVID-19 we're specialized in education but because everyone was fighting COVID-19 all the resources and all that people wanted to talk about was COVID-19 so how can we interlink COVID-19 its needs and all the other the needs of young people and that's something that we started working on and we had amazing strategies we had online meetings online trainings online conferences and it was absolutely beautiful and other than that we actually brought to the spotlight what young people were doing amidst the global pandemic you know how exactly are they coming up with a solution how are they being a voice how are they tackling issues in their own way we found that for instance young people were not able to access arvs um not young people but just generally people were not able to access arvs because of the long queues and everyone thought it was unsafe and so we found that there were young people who created machines that could easily give them access from anywhere they were to these ARVs. And it was amazing how young people were able to economize on what resources we had and actually use that to bring out solutions. So over the past year, honestly, I, I won't say that it's been all good, it's been all roses and it's been excellent, but we've been learning, we've been trying, we've been implementing, and we've been bringing in young people, the people that are most affected, to tell us how exactly we can make it better and we've been striving to do that so those are some of the things that we had um, done last year thank you so much you give such a livid impression of, of what you do and uh, Louisa what you would think over the last year was like a basic experience that that explains how you work and what are you working for so um, well, of course, I mean, um, uh, mostly um, right now I'm very humbled of what um, Natasha, of what you talked about and how much energy you, you got out of this crisis situation, which I think is something very um, special and very uh, valuable. Um, I think so. Um, 
there was a time in the beginning of the pandemic, which was round about one year ago, when a lot of people actually got into a mode in a in a way of this crisis as an opportunity to kind of make out of this moment. There was a lot of energy in the air, and there were initiatives popping up everywhere, trying to you know make the best out of this very situation. And actually, we saw like in a, an incredible amount amount of creativity coming up, thinking of people who suddenly went online with uh, school work and uni university work with new community things popping up. And so Fridays of Future, um, we also ask ourselves, similar as, as your foundation did, how can we be of use right now? How can we be useful for societies? And actually in social movement theory, that's a very important step when there's a crisis situation hitting society, being, um, of value for the society is really important for movement as it turns out because that is effectively what builds trust that we are there for the people when it's you know when it's getting hard and that we can later on get back to the people they you know they know we were there for them and so later on we, they would be there for us we figured so what we did is we went online with certain things we um, organized some youtube um uh, series um, that we hosted, Kuzana Sochula was featured there as well. We talked about, um, you know, what people should know about the situation. And also, we made use of the fact that most people just suddenly had a lot of time left um, that they could fill with, you know, educational um, things. And given that the the existential threats, at least in Germany and many European countries, were quite low, uh, we could actually make use of the time. Globally, however, it's really difficult for a global movement to cope with a situation where, um, you know, the, the velocities in which societies evolve drift so much apart. So suddenly we were in a fundamentally different space than um, young people in India, young, young people in Great Britain, young people in the UK or in uh, the US in, in Mexico. So suddenly it is, it, you know, I think we have the feeling so today that there is um, much less of a coherence that we see globally that was quite there before the pandemic. But coming back to the to the first time of the pandemic, there was this first wave, as we called it, and we tried to be somewhat useful in many places and try to be there for the most vulnerable, whether that was, um, you know, less privileged people in Germany or just, you know, societies and movements around the world. Yet, however, that has changed. So um, what I see is that right now in the so-called second wave of the pandemic, um, what we're seeing is much less energy um, there to kind of, you know, tackle the crisis, make the most out of it, making this an opportunity and much more of what I would call a crisis depression. So people are just really sick and tired of crises in any case. And we as a climate justice movement are the ones who are bothering now yet again with another crisis. So that obviously is a very tricky situation. And people start questioning um, whether this corona pandemic will be over so soon. We get mutations everywhere. The, you know, the, the vaccine business is getting is being very slow. So there is much more of a skepticism about the future. There is much more of a, you know, less... Um, joyful attitude towards overcoming this um, crisis or making anything out of this. Um, so that has actually changed a lot of the narrative that we used, whereas a year ago we talked about, you know, tackling the pandemic and, you know, fight every crisis. We wouldn't do that anymore right now. As more we think that right now it's not about the energy we have to get over this crisis, but what we are seeking, what we're looking for, what maybe the greatest challenge is right now is to create this image in 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 the in the, in the society and in, in that open space that there is that image even in, in people's minds and people mindsets that there is another world that is possible and we say it so easily you know we are unstoppable another world is possible yet in fact most people don't believe it anymore and suddenly the the so called normality before corona is becoming the most appealing thing ever people just you know strive to get somewhat out of a you know somewhat out of any kind of crisis there is and into this kind of life that seemed to be so easy and so that is um what we're thinking about right now what we're working on right now is actually creating this you know this future that we are fighting for that is worth fighting for and that connects these crises that we're seeing because obviously they're all connected I have listened to a lot of interviews you, you two gave. Uh, first, uh, um, both of you seem to have um, some very troublesome experiences. You, you Lisa, talk about uh, the loss of your father, for example. You, Natasha, talk about being bullied at school. 
Yeah, so, and so, so can you talk about how you've gained strength out of some very awkward and very sad and stressful experiences? Because I think this is what we really need in the crisis is we need about a good idea of the future. But uh, what I find really um, not uh, fascinating in, in your own biography is that you really say, well, there are times of loss and we are vulnerable. And not just despite, but because of this, we can thrive. And so this is what I really want to talk about a bit. If you could share your experiences, it doesn't have to be these two experiences. I am just talking about it because you have talked about it public, uh, in public before, but really how do you really deal with the crisis yourself and how do you gain strength out of it? Coming to how to overcome certain challenges, well, it's honestly never going to be easy. Um, my, my, my mom always tells me this. She says, um, for instance, we're Christians. And so she's always telling me, your faith, your belief in God is not relevant when it's all good, when it's all rosy and everything. Your faith in God is tested when everything seems as though God is against you. And you just standing on it and saying he's not. And that's just an example of how we can overcome any challenge out there. It's understanding that firstly, there will always be something difficult that you have to step over. There will always be something that you have to overcome, whether you're young, whether you're old, it doesn't matter who you are, female, male, there will be a challenge that will come your way. And what determines who you really are is how you overcome those challenges. That's what determines your strength and everything. And so, um, like you said, um, I, I'll start with that particular one. I was bullied for a very, very long time um, in, in junior secondary no, not junior secondary in primary school and I, I i didn't know how to defend myself i had no idea because coming from the schools where i had previously been to i was always the star i was always the shining one i was always the smartest one and i still was all that at school but then it's just that all that was turned into a weakness for me it was like what used to be a strength everywhere else was turned into a weakness in at that particular school and everyone hated me because of that and you know I had gotten used to people liking me because I was smart because I was young and because of all those things but then it was like everyone hated me because of that now and I didn't know how to deal with that because it never happened before until this one time I just had enough and I won an award at school I was walking down from the assembly hall and this bully wanted to get my award from me and tear it was a certificate so he wanted to tear it she wanted to tear it rather and I looked at her, I grabbed my certificate and I just spoke. I don't know where the words came from. I don't know how it happened. I don't know where the energy came from. I spoke, I did, I said the worst things. I became the bully in that moment and I made her cry. And she ran away crying because of everything that I said. And I realized after some years that I actually turned all her weaknesses, everything I noticed about her and used it against her to try and defeat her. And that made me the bully in the moment. But then this is what I'm trying to say in this particular moment. What we may have looked at and seen as a strength back then, you know, all the things that COVID-19 didn't take away from us, that was our strength, you know, the meetings, the being able to talk to people, to interact in a normal way, being able to do things the normal way it felt like a strength because we were making progress because we we're doing everything and then COVID-19 came and like some blindfold or something it just came and all of a sudden everything became a weakness and we do not know how to make that a strength but that's where it comes down to who we are and what we can actually do if we are in this generation we best believe that we have the solutions for this generation if we're in this generation we best believe that they still hope in because we're still alive and there's still so much more that we can do and this is also dawning on the question on creativity i know you said that will come later on but then it's about how do you envision your world don't lose that vision in as much as COVID-19 may come and may have seemed to have changed the world don't lose the vision of who you want to be do you want to be a scientist don't lose that vision do you want to be an engineer do you want to be a journalist whatever you want to be don't lose that vision instead just find ways in which what may seem like weaknesses right now can actually be a strength before we were talking about online you know like the internet we we're talking about how it spoiled all our kids you know it's making us very lazy and everything but then the internet is the most important tool that we have right now and that changed into a strength so what else have we been looking down on what what else have we been seeing and thinking this is irrelevant for these times but that we can actually maximize on and turn into a strength for this global time so i feel like that's the direction we should really look at how to overcome challenges is in looking at ourselves and realizing that we are our greatest weakness and we are our greatest strength that for me is how i've overcome most of my challenges honestly at first it feels as though it's really bad but then i look within i look around i look at everyone else that's there and I make sure that I maximize on that. And the second and last thing I'll just point out is people. 
one thing we should realize is that in a world where it feels as though connection has been cut off in the most devastating ways, people are the one resource that we should never let go of. People are the are, are what make us go through everything and we actually feel as though it is safe, it is okay, and that there's actually hope at the end of it all. So let's treasure the lives of the people around us. We are not alone. In as much as we might feel isolated, we might be in lockdowns, we are not alone. And the people around us are what's going to make it worthwhile. So let's do as much as we can to still connect, to get as much as we can from people because where my imagination ends, someone else's begins and we can build a whole world, a whole different world by just learning how to connect and ensure that we actually connect with the people around us. So people and who you are, these two, if you have them by your side, then trust me, you can overcome any global pandemic, any global crisis, and you'll be able to be the voice, light, and solution that you ought to be. So um, that's that's what I would, I would say on, regarding that. Thank you very much for your powerful uh, for your powerful speech and how you really see, as you said, if you've been, as you have been bullied, you're not running away, you're just facing it. Yeah, and you, you make a difference and you have you talked about solidarity. And Risa, do you feel like it's, is there something, something different in this question or is this some similar experiences? I would first of all um, second um, a lot of what you mentioned, Natasha. I think um, like two aspects stand out to me, especially the one is um, I think it's a really helpful perspective to consider life to be also just, you know, an assemblance of crises. And, you know, when one crisis is over or one challenge or one, you know, moment of struggle, another one will come along. So, you know, there's, I think it's quite easy to get into this kind of mode of we wait for this to be over and then better times will come along. Actually, that is, I don't, you know, I don't think it's working like that very much. And maybe, especially not in the 21st century, which we know is the century that is packed with crises, whether we like them or not, and whether we want to see them or not, and whether we want to accept them or not. So, you know, considering, you know, um, you know, crisis is to be present somehow and then asking ourselves okay what do we do with these crises and i think that is the other really interesting aspect that you you mentioned you know looking um, at a crisis or from a crisis at ourselves and asking ourselves what is it that we do in a crisis and knowing that what we do in a crisis to an extent at least defines who we are as people and I think that is actually something that, you know, twists the, the, the Christ perspective that we often carry as this, you know, additional burden that just, you know, necess or definitely has to bring us down into something that is happening and we have a decision to make in a way of how do we deal with that. And I would also, you know, I feel um, maybe three other um, quick points to that. I think, first of all, it's um, really, really helpful, at least it helps me a lot, um, is to to acknowledge a crisis or a moment of struggle of personal challenges as a moment of personal challenges. Oftentimes we look back and we, and we, we, we see a crisis only looking back. But you know, looking around you in a certain situation, a certain moment, in a certain pandemic, whatever, and acknowledging that this, this is a moment of crises um, can help so much to understand why you feel a certain way, why it is that we are unaggressive or impatient or, you know, you know, less um, empathetic or whatever. So I think this is actually um, something that, um, you know, I picked up recently and um, it is confusing people sometimes when we are, in a, um, when we are in a planning some certain projects or so. And I look around and say, you know what, people, I think we are in a, in a challenging situation right now. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and people look around and they're like, Louisa, what are you saying? And I think that's actually, um, that is actually something really um, beautiful, um, which can be so empowering, just acknowledging that a crisis is there, whether it's a big or small crisis. Secondly, I think, um, so yeah, you talked about, you know, vulnerability helping to, you know, overcome struggles. And I don't actually think that there can be courage, any kind of courage without vulnerability. So I don't think that, you know, what is courage if you aren't vulnerable, if you don't struggle, if there isn't a challenge, you know, that's just, um, in a sense, it's, you know, it's normality. It's what, you know, it, that would be everyday life. A challenge is something that you only, um, you know, come along as you struggle. Um, and it is a struggle that defines a challenge um, even. Um, so I think um, there is a, um, we're, we're really, I think it's, it's also a German cultural thing that we are really bad 
and you know defining the present struggles we're facing as a struggle and we usually just define them as a weakness that we kind of try to cover up um but you know taking the struggle as it is and you know coming along with the struggle and you know turning this into some kind of challenge that we're willing to overcome that we're able to overcome has something really powerful and as yes and as you as as you said, when I um, when I was 19, my uh, my father got a um, deadly disease, and um, that was a that was a um, complete mode as, a mode of crisis for me, and something that I thought would only happen to other people necessarily, and that I was um, I was so I was in a sense even disappointed to the world because um, what I knew about cancer and um, today's a world cancer day and um, go and treat yourself people go to for Zorga, please um what I knew about cancer was that it you know happens in a really romantic way that was what Hollywood told me and so when my when my dad got cancer I was I was disappointed I, I felt betrayed because I thought this is kind of a beautiful disease and eventually you get some good treatment and it's nothing beautiful about that as I uh, experienced it and there wasn't a treatment available um and I thought this wasn't possible I felt it was so deeply unfair I couldn't cope with that and uh, what I um you know and suddenly I was put into the situation that I had to make a decision about what kind of um, what kind of morning person, morning person do I want to be? What kind of, you know, daughter I want to be in this moment? How do I want to, you know, what kind of person do I want to be in this challenge? And I think it is really that that situation I was put into that forced me in a complete different dimension to, you know, confront myself um, with the question of who I want to be in this in this struggle, and. Um, Nobody could, could you know, I couldn't put this away from me. I couldn't, you know, ignore it. I couldn't, you know, uh, deny it or something like that. And that I feel eventually was what enabled me to look the climate crisis in the eye as I do now, because it is way too easy to ignore the, the climate crisis we're facing, the ecolog ecological breakdown. It is very easy to put it aside as an issue that doesn't concern you. Yet, if we are really honest, it concerns everyone, no matter where you are, no matter your age, no matter, no matter your gender or whatever. And um, it is hard, it is, it's, it's a challenge itself to, to confront the climate crisis like that. And yet once you do it, and you know, what's hard about it is it's, it's not the confrontation itself, but it's the question that comes along with it. Is this the question of who I want to be in this crisis? What do I want to make out of this crisis? Do I accept it as a crisis? And do I, you know, reflect on myself and on what role I play in this crisis? And these are also these incredibly inconvenient questions that, you know, these crises bring along into our lives. And I, yeah, and I think I decided out of this, um, experience that I made before to to ask myself these uncomfortable questions and to um yeah and um, decide for myself what I want to do and I decided I wanted to do everything I can to to stop it to prevent those um climate disasters to proceed thank thank you very much to to the two of you for your honesty and and, and openness because I think there's so 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 little room for really talking about being vulnerable and there's a, uh, I think, very important saying in Judaism is say, well, the, the day starts in the night, it starts in the evening, and you go through the darkness into light, and it's not the other way around. Um, so we have talking about this kind of uh, loss, and you, Luis, say in just another interview, say, well, it's a loss of something that will never come back. You get, never get another father, we will never get yes. another planet, we will never get another youth. So, so that I think that's really making that's we're talking really about serious matters. Um, I, I really don't want to ask what makes you unique as as young people, what makes you unique as women, because I imagine a world where it's just normal that a woman and youth speaks. So, so this is not what I'm talking about now. But I want um, we're talking about vulnerabil uh, vulnerability and so on. And say what makes your work like really special. Um, when I listen to interviews, it's so um, less about hierarchy. You're not really concerned as some, as, if someone is a prime minister or something. So there seems to be something new 
you're talking about the openness, uh, the energy, Natasha, you just stand for. So what makes you, um, your work like, like special? And I mean, more like in a personal dimension. What is uh, unique about what we do? Well, um, I think what we are seeing on a larger scale is that um, for a long time, maybe forever even, um, power and wisdom and the right to speak and more importantly, the right to decide was defined by the amount of time already spent on earth. So it was a matter of age and then of course of gender and um, and skin color, of course. And um, this is changing. Um, and it's basically the other way around. It, at least that's a process we're seeing is that the right to speak, the right to decide, the right to have a seat on the table, the right to you know, claim certain rights um, is more and more defined by the time that will be spent on the planet in the future. So that is you know, where um, this kind of definition of wisdom doesn't work out anymore. And that is, I think, you know, creating this whole new um, environment where people are most of all just people. And whether they're, as you say, prime ministers or scientists or students or citizens, they're all right now people in a, in a huge crisis and they have a decision to make. And that decision is what kind of person am I in this crisis and am I helping to overcome it in a just and sustainable way or am I standing in the way or am I pretending it doesn't concern me and obviously there is a huge amount I mean we're talking of multiple crises coming along now so I think it's important to acknowledge that you know many many people around the world are just struggling because they're already hit by this crisis and they're you know not thinking about the end of the year but the end of the next day and so on but there's you know thinking about everyone else who would be technically in this somewhat privileged situation to make such decisions still has to make it and it becomes you know um it is what we're seeing is that it becomes clearer and clearer how people decide for themselves what kind of part they are playing in this and since we have no time to lose there is no point in not calling that out and it not you know, and then, you know, using the nice words uh, to cover up the fact that um, younger generation, the ones at the front lines, the most vulnerable are being betrayed right now. And that is actually, I think that is something that is, um, you know, in this necessary development that we're seeing. Yet I fully understand that it must be deeply disconcerting, uh, deeply disruptive, deeply um, annoying also for many who thought, you know, they had their centuries on Earth, uh, decades on Earth, um, which I mean, maybe to the, some of them felt like centuries, and uh, they have nothing to fear and nothing to worry about, and they don't have to justify themselves anymore. And now we come along and kind of, you know, question all of that. I understand that some um, people might get angry about that. They shut up for their generation for when they were young, and, and I, that might be disrupting as well. Um, because they waited to have a voice uh, when they grow older, they don't. Yes, have. Um, very much. They waited to. They waited to, you know, claim a seat that would just be empty at some point, uh, without questioning what kind of seat that is and what kind of social hierarchy that seat stands. And now we're questioning basically everything. And I think that is, yeah. Um, I think it's really deeply disturbing because you say, well, um, you, we are so much used to instrumentalize our own lives. So, so while well, we just shut up in school because then we go to a nice university and we go to an university to have a nice job. And even like professors, I see, well, yeah, we would like to speak about a new economy and so on, but first we have to get professors. And, and I think that's what you stand for is that you're not allowing to get your own uh, presence instrumentalized. We say, well, you just speak up now and you just don't wait. And I think that's really, really disruptive. Hey, Natasha, is Maybe it just, sorry, if I can just mention one thing, because I think that is also the time question that is, because I don't know many young people who actually, you know, think about themselves when they're in their 40s and 50s, because I just cannot imagine what the world would look like then when we keep going as we do. So what's the point in waiting for something that, you know, maybe will be no more? And so I think that is also, you know, a different, completely new understanding of what kind of time this is and what kind of timing. 
Natasha, you have been spoken in Davos and, and uh, in a lot of places, and you're so forceful to say, well, give the voice to the young people. So, so what makes you and what in your eyes makes your young generation like making a difference, bring into uniqueness? Thank you so much for that question. And thank you so much once again. You know, like, I just keep being inspired by the wisdom that Louisa is spitting out here. It's really, really motivating and eye-opening. And honestly, it's making me view things from a different perspective. Like, it's, it, it's somehow what we can see, but then she's just putting it into shape and helping us realize just how dynamic the world has changed and how we are actually fitting into all that change. Um, I will make it a bit personal. Uh, when I was really young, I. I think I was about five years old, I would sit with my dad from about three years old, actually, I learned to, to read at three with newspapers. So my dad would come home and he would have newspapers out wide, wide open and I'll sit on his lap and would read the newspapers together. And that's where my interest in journalism and media started developing because I was seeing the news and I was never really seeing things that actually made news to me. Like I would see something has happened, but then for me, what was news was different from what was in the papers. And so I grew older and then this one time he came home with a camera and I would always record myself doing interviews like a journalist with my young brothers and everyone else around. And it was really beautiful because I just wanted to create the news and give a voice to a different aspect. You know, I wanted more of what I thought was news instead to be in the news. And so I created it myself. And so time went by and when I was 12 years old, I joined the Media Network on Child Rights and Development and that's how I was trained to be a junior reporter and it trained me to realize that there's so much news going on but yet the most affected people are not being covered in the news their voices are not being heard they're not making the news no matter how fantastic or phenomenal they are and it's like the world just forgets and just looks at what's depressing they look at the side of you know if if it's like for we were trained as journalists to know that it is what's dark, it is what's bleeding, it is what's bad that makes the news, not the glorious, not the happy, mostly that doesn't cut it. It's the bad, you know, the murder, the everything is going down, and that's what made the news. But then for us as an NGO, they trained us to know that it is not like that. It is about the young people out there that are actually trying to make a change to a world that seemed damaged and that just seemed like it was in need of help. And how can we be that help? And so I grew up and I studied journalism and right now I am at ZNBC and every day ZNBC is the top national broadcaster in Zambia by the way and every day I'm going out in the field and I am being exposed to the virus because I have to talk to new sources I have to do as much as I can but in everything that I do I always make sure that I try as much as I can to have a young person's voice and a young person's view on the matter heard and sometimes that's not always accepted by the editors sometimes that's just blushed at but then it's not it's, it's something we need to realize that in a world where many young people had so many other platforms to voice out and all those platforms have been shut down, how exactly are we giving them a voice to speak out? And why is it important to give them a voice? And so for me, I'm not going to answer that in the sense of what makes us unique or what makes my work unique, because honestly, it is everything around us that's unique. It is, it is not any more different than what anyone else is trying to do, only that in itself, it's trying to change the world and ensure that the most affected people are actually brought out and seen. And that's, yes, it is unique, but then it shouldn't be unique. It should be normal. It should be something that we actually get used to. Young people are supposed to be heard. Young people are supposed to be part of the solution. Young people are not supposed to be looked down on. And just because we're fighting in a different way to make that happen, doesn't mean it should be normal. I remember seeing a quote um, talking about how um, men who don't abuse their women, men who always buy their women gifts, men who are gentlemen deserve awards. And then someone commented saying, but that's what men are supposed to be. So why are we awarding men for being men? And that's what we should look at in this sense. What world are we trying? trying to have and why is it that whenever anyone does something different like trying to change the world and trying to make it better it's looked at as unique why can't we make it normal so that it makes the process even faster and quicker to happen you know like why can't we make young people doing the most normal why can't we make solution makers at the top of the table normal why can't we do that so that it makes the process faster and we create the world that we actually want to see Thank you so much. I, I just in a, in a minute I come back to the question of how, why do science? Why I'm a philosopher and economist? For me, it's to give voice to people that don't have a voice, and it's a, especially it's giving a voice to reality, and that's just what I think is an interesting connection. Uh, what you bo uh, what you two said, um, because um, if we grow older, we have so much stereotypes, 
and so much frameworks in which we think that we can't really see reality any longer. And I find it very beautiful for you, Natasha, to bring out all the stories from young people who really try to express their own reality. But it, looking back to this role of education and, and science just in a minute, I want to now come to talk about imaginations and the role they have. Uh, I come from a science um, like it, economist that has um, discovered the role of imaginations like two minutes ago, even if it has. Um, so let's talk about, uh, you have talking about a lot giving uh, positive imaginations of really having a future. And you just, Luisa, I think it's very interesting because you said, well, we can't imagine a future. We can't imagine ourselves as being 60 or 70. And at, at the same time say, where well, it's so important to imagine a positive future or even a livable future. And could you ex um, tell me about this, that, well, it doesn't seem to be like a normal reality that you have in front of you, but something that you can create anew. Could you talk about this a bit further? What you mean by creating imaginations and the role it has in climate activism, according to your own experiences? Well, I th think what we're experiencing is some sort of um, utopian desert. So that would be where we've kind of stopped imagining um, to an extent that, you know, the most inspiring um, version of reality is some kind of 2018 pre-corona situation. Um, and I mean, of course, we know all know that that kind of seemingly seeming normality was already a crisis, um, or was already multiple crises. Um, and um, that has to do uh, that is that goes back to to a number of reasons. I, I think one is just the fact that many people just cope with everyday life to an extent that you know we didn't do for a long time. But that also, you know, dreaming big. Um, you know, envisioning a different world, you know, is barely asked from you. So you kind of get around in life without doing that at all, ever. And there are very few spaces that kind of, you know, um, you know, actually demand you to do something like that. So the question would be, where would you even learn to think that way? Where would you learn to dream? And where would you learn that dreams aren't, um, aren't something you hide? Um, and dreams aren't happening at night, but you know, the real dreaming needs to happen at day. And um, where do you learn that what is utopian isn't always unrealistic and that what, you know, could be a future isn't always just, you know, um, stupidity and naive. So I think all those things um, aren't happening in, you know, educational systems, but they're also not happening inside the space, spaces that much. Um, and we are very good as activists as well. We're very, very good to question in questioning the status quo. And we are very, very bad in, um, you know, proposing alternatives. Um, I think we have a general fear of kind of proposing anything um, because we know that everyone is so good at taking everything apart. So obviously, you know, that is where we're spinning in loops. Um, yet what this, what this, you know, the consequence of that, of this utopian desert is that basically we get a whole energy, a whole drive, everything that moves us, we take from um, the, the dystopian views that are out there, the dystopian scenarios um, drawn by scientists, the government reports, um, what is, you know, what we are taking as a source of energy is the fear of that catastrophe that's kind of waiting at the other end of the tunnel and when we think of you know push and pull factors that could you know drive us we are being just you know pushed all the time we push ourselves away from that seeming catastrophe meaning that our, our picture of the future is you know unbelievably bad um, and uh, that obviously is everything but inspiring meaning when you look at um, Fridays for Future the for future part is not happening in Fridays for Future very much. There is little future in this. Um, you know, we have a future, but most of us are quite scared of that. And um, the same accounts for we are unstoppable. Yes, we are unstoppable. Is another world possible? I don't know, because we wouldn't know what this other world would look like. Yet imagine how, you know, this could look like once to flip it. And that is what I'm seeing again and again and again. Every time I, you know, I talk, I write, I speak about any kind of, you know, tiny bit of um, future scenarios, people come back to me and they say, actually, Louise, I haven't thought about that. 
But yes, it could be possible that you can cycle around in a town without being, you know, scared to be run over all the time. And it would be possible that we all live in a place where we know that there is no human rights violation happening in our supermarkets on any kind of product. So I think, you know, just imagining what would be possible once we believe it possible, once we believe it's possible and then make it possible. I mean, that's huge. And obviously, you know, given that we have this issue with timing, you know, the climate crisis, the ecological breakdown is just so fast and we need to catch up and we need to think in bigger jumps. And I think once we think about, you know, disruptive changes and the jumps we need to make, we need to think bigger in order to jump far, if that yeah, makes sense. So I think I'm a, I'm a huge um, um, uh, proponent of that and um, all so, you know, very much encourage um, us to kind of really dream, start dreaming big, start dreaming about that future that we want to see and allow ourselves to be pulled by that utopian narratives that, you know, um, imagine images of a future and um, to be, you know, let our imagination towards a better place drive us instead of, you know, uh, you know, just relying on a constant renewal about catastrophic scenarios that we need to kind of get us moving. Uh, Natasha, you always said that it's really about accepting like suffering and problems. And then you really talked about um, the energy, about the solidarity of people in the presence. And what role does imagination play uh, for you? Like in being able, as Luisa just said, to able to imagine a future we really, really want to live in and we really want to live in so much that we go start going working for it. Yeah, so like we've already established, we cannot avoid crisis. We cannot avoid having a world that seems like it's it's shutting down at any point. We do have to accept all those things and then find a way to actually fight back and see how that can be done. And that's really what imagination about is about. My mentor always tells me that imagination is basically just a well calculated vision. It's 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 you seeing something that you want to happen. So sometimes people think as though imagination is having all these talking rabbits and you know like talking animals and then it ends there but no imagination is about having a vision a well calculated vision of what you actually want to achieve and that's where it begins there is no meaningful change that can ever be attained that can ever even happen without someone thinking of that change and that's where it begins i i love madame pumzile um the un women um i can't remember the position precisely but then she said something she said societies only begin to change when a few individuals want to bring about change and that's where it starts from the imagination the willingness the, the the zeal to actually be able to look at something and think of a wonderful future and think of oh my this is what the future could look like we can actually live in a world where young people are healthy young people are growing they're developing they're getting the education they need and they are transitioning into adulthood while helping every other young person it's about being able to see it and then putting in what you want to the effort that you need in attaining it and that's where it all drives from if people don't have the mindset of change if people don't have the mindset of it is possible then we are already done for because that's why it's always going to start from and so the beginning also is at the leadership that we have i've always imagined how you know sometimes we look at terrorists and they're able to influence so many other people with one vision with their dream you know it's not it's not every it's not the thousands of troops that they have that had the same dream it is that terrorist who had one dream and he was able or he or she was able to influence the whole troop the whole crew to be able to actually go and attain that dream so with the leadership that we have, what sort of vision do our leaders actually have for us? And if they don't have the vision that's actually of hope, how can we, the people that have the hope, take over those positions and spread the hope to those around us? Because the truth of reality is that not everyone will have the brightest vision, not everyone will have the vision of change. But then just those one or two in society, if they are given the vital um, positions, if they are given everything that they need to be able to influence that change and ensure that it's inculcated in everyone else around, that's where it's all going to start from so firstly have the mindset the zeal the desire the vision the mission the ambition to actually want to create change but then you also have to know what sort of change this is going to be and then secondly be the leader that's actually going to take charge and spread your vision because one person can imagine the whole world changing but then if they don't have people to help them then that imagination is futile and that's the danger of it or you have to lead people with your vision of hope with your vision of transformation you have to be able to lead people into actually wanting to attain it and then the third one this is also another thing that sometimes gets young people a bit um you know 
I don't know what the exact word is, but then it can put them in a position where they feel as though they are inadequate. Young people are very passionate and zealous. I am very passionate and zealous. There's so many that are passionate and zealous. But then sometimes the vision can outweigh the work. We sometimes look at the vision and forget that there's so much work that has to be done and we have to learn to do that work. And if there's no one to train us, if there's no one to show us how that work is going to be done in as much as what we want as young people is very vital because we don't know how to get there, it becomes trouble. So firstly, yes, have the vision, have the people, but then understand what needs to go into that. And so for me, I feel like those are the first steps we have to take in imagining a better world and how that imagination can pan out and help us create the world that we want so really have the vision have the people but know that i think coming from here to where to the vision that we have is going to take a lot of work and you must be able to put in everything that you have everything that you need to to ensure that you can do the work and get that done so um it's it's fun, it's very hopeful, it's wonderful to look at, it's wonderful to think about, but then it's also a lot of work and we have to embrace the work and that's where we have to now also look into it and say, we have the vision, the work is on the ground, what are we going to do to do it and who are our people and then we have to get to it. So for me, that's what I think of when I think of imagining a better world and how we can get from here to the world post COVID-19 and all that we want to achieve. So I, I want to make it kind of concrete for we are starting a new um, uh, uh, a new study course, a master study course in economics, and it will be called economics, imagination and creation of the future. And for some reason, which is quite remarkable, it has been state accredited. Or it's almost state accredited. So I'm starting it in autumn and I'll come back to you and ask you how, how I should do it. Um, if you really see that um, universities can change, so bring in kind of imagination, really talk about economics and the suffering it creates and so on, what you would like to see um, in, the, in the university of the future that has such, such that's, let's just imagine we have universities that have such courses and it's going to be normal. So what would, you, would be your dream to include? What would you like to be taught? What would you like to teach? How would you like to learn? And so we just um, close this uh, wonderful discussion so that you may help me create something that can make a difference for young people. That's, that's beautiful. It sounds like an incredible uh, course. Um, well, I think first of all, I want to learn things that I don't know that I want to learn. So I think, you know, um, in, in the information age, um, we assume way too easily that we know most things or can know most things. And that is, in fact, not true because, you know, no matter how much information is out there, it's not about you just consuming information, but it's about thinking. It's a bit more about, you know, the school of thought and not the school of information. And, um, you know, we... Um, are set, setting up training courses for activists right now a lot and so I took a lot to, uh, to trainers and I, I asked them so uh, can can you teach us that and can you teach us that and can you teach us that and they would usually say well Lisa that's all very interesting but I actually don't think that this is what you need because if you wanted to know that you would go and google it and you would maybe it sometimes would take a bit longer but you would still do it and it's often the thing that we don't know about and that we don't know that might be useful for us. And so the things that are we should be skeptical about um, that that may be the most um, value for us. That's that's one thing. So I want to be in, in one of those, but just think about those schools. I want to be surprised and I want to look at it. And I want to say, oh, I don't think I would like this. And I want to sit there in the first lesson and be like, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to take anything away from this. And I want to come back in the second lesson and think, well, actually, um, this kind of got me thinking. Um, and that is effectively, free, I think, that kind of learning that sticks around. And then, um, secondly, I think it's, um, I feel, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm a geographer. Um, so I, I think a lot about how geographies and the thinking about geography and, you know, using geographical perspectives, how that can, you know, change, um, well, the world, obviously. And um, what I often see that there's this huge discrepancy between what people learn and what kind of what part of that knowledge they apply. And we learn so much about the world and about, you know, its crises and its struggles and the challenges that we're facing. Yet the knowledge we apply often, you know, is just, you know, this tiny fraction that comes down to kind of Excel sheets and consultation work. And um, 
I feel, and it, it gets me, it, it worries me a lot that I feel sometimes it's we're learning in two kind of ways. One is learning, learning, and one is learning for life. And the learning for life part is reduced to kind of taxes and, uh, you know, um, media competence. And that allows basically people who are so well informed about what is wrong with various systems to go out and ignore all that knowledge uh, you know working on something completely else uh, in some kind of you know <laughs> uh, status quo environment and so I think effectively knowledge in this time in the 21st century in the year 2021 is about um, you know touching this part of the people that is driving them and that is leading them leading their knowledge to allow actual change making, to allow ourselves to be this kind of um, guidance um, about what do we do with that and how do we, you know, what kind of role we take in the world. Thank you so much. Yes, see me writing. Um, and uh, thank you very much. And I think it's it's very um, to really get over this that to first know and then do. And that's what we really try to first do and then science is there to make you reflect it and to dig into deeper into it and to repair history and all those kind of stuff and not just to be in the ivory tower. Natasha, what you would, what you would like to advise? So I would love to learn about myself. And this is something that we do, of course, expect at the end of 12 years. You know, most people tell you that by the end of 12 years, you would have known who you are, but mostly people still come out of you know school not knowing who they are. And so that's something I'd really love to learn about myself, how I think, how I work, how my emotions work, how I put that into play, even as I'm trying to be creative and imaginative, because it's my whole being, it's who I am that actually brings out what I think, it brings out what I'm able to do and what I define creativity to be. And so I would love to begin by knowing who am I you know like how am I even on this planet where am I supposed to bring out the most change you know if I was in another place or if I was in another continent or something how was I going to still be relevant there you know it's about I would love to know about me why I exist what I'm doing here and how that can be of value to the world and I know that's something that a lot of people have been trying to attain and I'm very very glad and delighted because I know that this university will definitely do that with its students but I would really love to know who I am and in as much as it is a university it's after all those 12 years it's still something that people do need to learn who they are and why it matters um, another thing I'd love to learn are the things that can actually help me with my day-to-day -day life something I've always looked back at is I wonder how much better, for instance, I would have been at relating or making connections if I was taught on relationships at school, on how to relate with people, how to talk to people people how to communicate how to just basically connect and in as much as sometimes these are things that are viewed as a social as something that you learn based on your environment I feel as though with all the hours we spend at school if this can also just partly be taught it would be vital because it feels as though the whole world is honestly just about connections have the right connections and yet I'm not even talking about like the illegal corrupt connections or anything like that but then just being able to connect and relate with people how to form such relationships or simple things like how to save how to save money why it's important to do that things that I can use in my day-to-day -day life so for me those are some of the things I'd love to learn you know things that I can apply in the now um, things that we don't always see at school things that you don't always learn at school not just for the sake of my career but things that I need for my life because I feel like it is from there that everything else falls into play and then finally I would love to learn a lot more about leadership we're living in a world where everyone has got so much to say everyone has got their own vision but not so many people know how to carry it out not so many people know how to lead not so many people know how to even just do whatever they have to do with their own vision and so not just leading a community of people but leading myself how can I be more self-disciplined how can I then in turn use that and lead other people and these are skills that a lot of young people need from a very young age and this is something that I would honestly would love to learn even if I turn 30 or 40 or whatever it's still something that is necessary because leading yeah, oneself yeah. and leading other people are vital for any type of change or any sort of change that we want to make so for me those are the three things I would love to learn who I am um personal skills that are very important for one to live their day-to-day -day life and then finally leadership in all its aspects what makes me really I think the difference for me and this is, I could just say in this uh, 60 minutes we had now that 
for me as a teacher was to really trust people and was to put trust in the young people, but not only young people, but really in the reality of life of people and to see there is something beautiful in it and to give them the power to bring it out. I think this is one of the most important motivations we could have in education. And so this is what we try to bring as a positive example. And it's very little, um, but it can make a difference. At least that's what I hope. And I was really encouraged by you to and really say that it's worth putting trust um, in people, putting trust in young people and women and to be, to, um, to be made heard.